How is everyone today? Very good. Great. It's good to Great. see you. Good to see Great. everyone. So I have it as 12 o'clock. I don't know if we should start precisely on the dot. <laughs> I just, it feels so odd talking from my office. <laughs> there aren't real people in front of me. I uh, see Ted. Yeah. Hello there, George. Maybe I'll Ted? start the video. Okay, so, oh, jo am I supposed to record this? It's uh, currently recording. Oh, great. So uh, <laughs> I'm glad I wasn't swearing and doing my normal sort of thing. What I'll do is um, I'll welcome everyone. I'm just trying to remember how this goes and modify it for this particular uh, way of doing things. I, I have no idea if I'm speaking too loudly or not. You can tell me if I'm off. Yes, it is. You're good. Great. So my name is Dennis Cooley. I am the director of the Northern Plains Ethics Institute. Um, Science Religion Lunch Seminar was founded many years ago by Davis Cope. Uh, he's since retired and we have taken it over. Uh, we're trying to do this in the era of COVID, which has turned out to be quite the challenge, um, although I think we're succeeding. We had a great presentation last time, and uh, I want to thank him again for uh, the insightful look into Buddhism. I do have an opening two weeks from today if anybody would like to present on science, religion, lunch, or lunch, of course. Um, please send an email to me so we can get you in and we can get you ready to go. As you know, if you're on our listserv, we, there are also other events that are going on right now. Uh, including uh, December 2nd, we have a, uh, a talk on race, what uh, causes people to be racist, so developmental psychology. So there's a lot of interesting things going on. Okay, so I have not tried to do this host myself before, and what I'm going to do is share my screen and my PowerPoint, see if I can pull this off. So where's my, oh, there's my PowerPoint. Okay, so I'm assuming everybody sees this. Yes. Yep. It's up. Yep. Okay. So I, it's, again, I usually read people when I'm talking. Uh, unfortunately, I can see either the screen or you, but generally not both. Uh, if Mr. Waltz is on, hopefully he can look for chat questions as we go along uh, uh, so that I can keep up. I usually like folks to ask me a question for clarification as we go, and then the big questions held to the end so that we can talk a little bit more about it. Now, what caused me to write this uh, paper? It actually started prior to the COVID stuff, but uh, the pandemic has made it even stronger. My concern is that there are a lot of folks doing really good work, accurate work, they're reliable sources of information. But what's happening is when we have some folks who don't stay within their uh, the fenced off area in their discipline. So they exceed their uh, portfolio and they say things they shouldn't say, or they make claims that are too strong. And then when uh, it comes out that they're wrong, it undermines other people's credibility. So we, I think we're entering a crisis, or if we're not actually there, of experts. That is people relying on them. So I'll, instead of talking it all the way through, I'll just move along. So there's a lack of trust, I think we've seen. Uh, experts and their expert opinions no longer have the respect they once enjoyed. It used to be somebody would say, I am this person with this credentials and we'd listen to them. No longer as much so. What caused this? I think there was a, in public, there's an intentional or unintentional destruction of reputation to serve various private and public political purposes. So it's it's been politicized heavily. And then I think there's also uh, some problems with the private sphere that people's egos or their desire for reputation had some uh, causal effects on this. And Part of this was a, a desire to broaden the franchise. Uh, so just making more people professionals in the first place. So there are those of us with PhDs after our names, uh, which we zealously guard. 
we're considered to be less valuable than maybe somebody with a medical degree after our name. <laughs> that uh, our expertise isn't as important. And then we can go on with uh, what the quality or the prestige of the different degrees are. I also think there's a fetish, as they call it, fetishification, I can't say it, of the view that each person's opinion is as good as anyone else's on the subject. So part of that is right. If we're talking about what we want for lunch, then it probably your aesthetic taste is just as good as anybody else's. Unless, of course, you're a big Ludafisk fan. Then I think that we've got some problems, maybe psychological issues involved. <laughs> some of you are glaring at me. Others are agreeing, fairly agreeing with that one. But the idea that anybody's view matters equally really has been propounded by a lot of different folks. And then finally, scientific and other literacy. There are a lot of folks who have no idea how any of this works, but get online and question a whole bunch of individuals. For example, I see with a recent vote count, there are individuals who are making statistical analysis that can't even be right for how many votes are left or what the percentage will be coming out of it. There are experts who have contributed to this. So they made major mistakes or there are scandals and there was a refusal to take adequate and timely accountability. One is a guy by the name of Mark Hauser who falsified data on some of his primate studies that blew things apart on how we develop our moral psychology. There's overblown reports of findings which happens too often. I think media is involved with that too. And then there's poor interactions with lay persons, including the public in a changed society, where you get people very angry at each other. And so there's an attack more than education going on. So a lot of people have gotten the reputation, especially if they're from universities, as having a reputation of arrogance and hubris. And I don't know if any of you've run into this, but there's an assumption that we think we're better than everyone else which is unfortunate. Where do we find this being reinforced? Media portrayals and bad actors, the people who are actually doing this. It makes an incredibly compelling narrative that these individuals in ivory towers are these arrogant individuals who don't care about anyone else. Additionally, a lot of times experts don't understand how their activities with people, not in their disciplines or fields appear to those in the lay community, Philosophy, for example, is very, very oriented towards critically evaluating arguments. We analyze things, we ask hard questions. That's just normal to us. Um, one time I was told by a sociologist that we're really mean to each other. We're vicious, cruel, but that's just how our field goes. So somebody viewing us from outside might think we're really nasty when we're not. In other places we see this is the specialized language, the values, the rules for interaction might be alien and off-putting to other people. So how does this happen? How do we get experts who go astray? Well, I'm going to say they're generally very bright people and they've been recognized as such as others in their fields and communities. So this is a self-esteem ego sort of thing where they've been built up as experts that should be deferred to. So we have our publications and other social recognition, or rec recognition sorry, including merit-based rewards. So the more you publish, the more people should defer to your opinion. We expect to receive the same deference and respect we have in our own small community from everybody we meet. And I've actually run into <laughs> one time, I had a paper out for review in Europe, where I do most of my publishing, the reviewer said, what does somebody from North Dakota know about ethics? And the editor, when I pointed that out, was so embarrassed. But the when I run into it, people ask me about North Dakota. They think we're Fargo. Um, and it just, it, there's a disconnect. Over time, our egos and self-esteem become bound to this recognition of deference and that we're respected because of what we've done. And some of that is justifiable pride. But other times we get what I call ego creep. We think that we have greater capacities and capabilities than we do. You're an expert in one area doesn't mean you're an expert in all areas. 
And so sometimes people will come to you and say, tell us about this. We don't, we shouldn't say anything. Um, just because somebody asked us a, our opinion on a particular thing doesn't mean we're an authority. Although we have lots of opinions, sometimes we shouldn't share those. So here's one of the false authorities. Uh, we have the fallacy of reasoning in which an individual who is an actual authority in a field either presents himself as more knowledgeable in the area of study than he actually is. So somebody might say, have you read the newest study that came out? The person has it, but they might have an opinion on it anyways. Or the person who assumes expertise in a related areas in the discipline when they actually don't have sufficient amount of uh, information. So I'm a generalist in ethics. I could talk about general ethics, but if you ask me specific questions, say in media ethics, I can't say, I shouldn't say anything at all because I don't know the subject area well enough. But sometimes it's uh, tempting when people are asking you to provide your opinion on it. Different type is a fallacy of reasoning in which an individual who is an actual authority in one field thinks he's authority in all other fields. So somebody might be an authority on a, a, a virologist, might be offering opinions on something that's related, but not exactly the same thing. For example, I saw this on uh, one of the news networks. When they were being asked about uh, the death rates for COVID, this person was an expert on the transmission of COVID to other people, but was not an expert on predicting how many people would die and so on with any sort of modeling, but was making these claims, including they asked him, well, 2 million people dead. And the person said, that's a possibility and left it at that. No follow-up, no uh, discussion of probabilities which should have influenced or uh, informed the listeners what was going on. Uh, Einstein, for example, was actually asked questions outside of his field, and he offered his opinion on a lot of different things, sometimes well and sometimes not. Uh, for example, he knew quite a bit about philosophy, but he was giving views on philosophy that he actually shouldn't have been talking about because he hadn't been doing the reading that he needed to know. Um, we also have this view that successful business people are assumed to be experts in government, how government runs. And we keep finding repeatedly that this is not the case. They, so they can be great at their business, but that's a different thing from running political organizations. So <laughs> what happens when you know that something's gone wrong is if you question their expertise, the individual thinks it's an attack on them. So this is an ego issue. To not agree with them quickly as they want is to question their self-value. So they think that they're a lot better. And if you say, well, are you really sure you know what you're talking about? This is a way of getting somebody angry at you. The false authority must be reinforced because they can't admit to being mistaken about something or saying, look, I, I, th this isn't true. So self-esteem is, is determined by how well an individual functions within the given circumstances to achieve his objectives then him finding out his opinion is less value than someone you've, uh, else leads to a really strong negative reaction. So they usually act out. Um, this, by the way, happened at one of our meetings uh, when we were we had uh, Kwame Anthony Appia, who is an expert on racism. During the, that uh, discussion, there was in the chat, this occurred. These, I actually took this right from the chat, the Zoom thing. So this is a person on campus uh, who was questioning the lack of a female host. By the way, there are only two people who were hosting the event. I was one of them and Appia was the other one. So it, I'm not sure what was going on here. There was no panel. There was no real issue here. But if you read this, uh, there's the individual, um, Mr. Taggart had a problem with the female host. So he wanted to have representation. By the way, there should be integration and so on. Sometimes though, you have to say it doesn't make sense. So Re Rebecca Hager said, why would that be important? She's just questioning. And I said, this is in a panel and so on. Our guest is Professor Appian. He'll gauge the audience, so what we usually do. 
And then instead of just letting it go and say, oh, I didn't understand, there's a reinforcement of the host, the Zoom hosts are all male. So why do that? <laughs> and as I said, this is just once the challenge comes in, you have to reply to satisfy your ego. You can't just say, yeah, I was wrong. Sorry about that. So how can this exchange be interpreted between three people? And by the way, Rebecca Hager is up at uh, um, one of the... Uh, I think it's, is it Standing Rock or is it one, a different one? I can't remember where she's at. So if you're outside of this, and some of you aren't NDSU folks, but you're associated with us or so, how did you interpret that exchange? Were we angry at each other? Were we, <laughs> were we uh, any of us ding-dongs? <laughs> and I'll leave that as a, a question to you now. What did you think of that exchange? How would you have interpreted that if I had said nothing about it? Rita, do you want to say something? Not on this. I have a, a point that I'd like to bring up at a later time regarding an incident with a student in my class. Oh, great. But I think if you looked at that and I slowed down a little bit, how we speak to each other is alien to a lot of individuals who aren't part of that tribe or that little club. And so what happens is how we're being interpreted isn't necessarily how we think we're being interpreted. So various groups outside of NDSU, if they saw that exchange, they might say, um, look, are you trying to enforce this approach when it doesn't actually work? Or are they understanding what was going on there? Okay, so I'm going to get into the more controversial part of this now, actually. We might sound like arrogant jackasses within our individual fields, but we definitely are jackasses, according to those outside of these communities. So even as I'm presenting now, you might think that this is really something for people in academia, and it's not of any interest or to anyone else, or it's just an arrogant approach. Those inside our fields are familiar with how we speak and interact with each other. Those outside of our field may not have, may have enough overlap or not, but those who are far outside our fields, they don't understand how we talk to each other or how we communicate. So even what I'm doing now is off-putting to a lot of folks in our community because it assumes a certain base of knowledge, shared knowledge, so that we can speak to each other. Most of you have been at science, religion, lunch seminars for many times. So we have shorthand ways of speaking. And the point I'm making is other people from outside might not understand that shorthand. So what are, why are they having problems with interpreting it? We have signals to show these different things. First, there's the us versus them built in the community. If they're not part of how we talk to each other in the first place, then they don't feel as if they belong to the community. So they're already, there's an us versus them uh, condition. They might have a willingness to communicate, to interact, but they're alienated by how we do it, how we communicate, our demeanor and interaction. So some of us are better at enticing people to speak to them. Others can be off-putting, especially if we're loud we speak very quickly. We do these different things that you're probably recognizing now. We have an expectation that others will more readily accept him and what he says because he is an expert. So sometimes people get up there and they just exude this. They don't clearly don't want to be asked questions. I was at one event that there's a professor from NDSU said she wanted students to challenge her and she did everything she could in her body language to show she didn't actually want them to question her. And then when that one did, then it was overwhelming. So there's a sensitivity when questioned or not immediately accepted as a value, the person is for itself. So when you do question them, they, the person who's responding is, seems a little bit ticked off. Um, if the field is one that favors a more aggressive or very rigorous approach, then that also is the response when somebody's just trying to ask a question. Uh, 
many of us are accustomed to students and others deferring to us because we are experts in the class. By the way, this would be probably different for men and women, how men and women operate at a university and how students interact with us. And then finally, not everyone's a good communicator with all audiences. And we know of folks who are really smart who cannot communicate well at all. Now, where things go especially wrong, the material that the professional material, the expert material is too difficult to be made simple for outsiders. Some of the work we do is really hard to understand and you can't break it apart without losing a whole bunch of it. So most people, by the way, expect they could understand anything if you explain it to them. The problem is not them and the fact that the information is too complicated. The problem is you as an expert not making it simple enough to be understood. If you can't, I, I've heard this one too, if you can't do an elevator speech in two or three minutes to explain all of this, then the idea is you're just making it too hard when you're really not. No one likes to be treated as if they're mentally defective. Um, the, we, I, I think most of us have received this when we're told you understand this issue and this stuff very well, we don't. So when you're getting a little testy about having to explain it yet again, then it's off-putting. They can see, by the way, most people are really good at mind reading, the nonverbal communication. They can sense when you're really open or you're trying to communicate well and when you're annoyed. One of the things I've just been writing about with Zoom, for example, is this destruction of nonverbal communication. It's really hard to read a room. So when I'm looking at you folks, I only see a few of you. I see you at odd angles. It makes it hard to communicate with you. And so you might think that I'm being different or I might misread how I'm communicating just because of the how we're doing it, the medium involved here. So the result is the individual who's speaking, the one who's had this unfortunate interaction because of their own fault or the fault of others or the, the medium itself, their viewpoint is degraded, downgraded as being less valuable than it actually is. So what we do next though is one person then becomes to represent the entire group of experts. So if you have one jackass, that must mean they're all jackasses. Why? Because we generalizing for us is automatic. We, our minds are incredibly fast. We try to figure out things very quickly, classify it. So if you're in a normal sort of uh, situation, your mind classifies quickly, you have a pattern of behavior, you immediately identify and you start operating in that way. If it's unusual circumstances, you're struggling. So if there's something new, you're trying to figure out how to respond or how to act. And only a few situations can create a, a category in your mind. If you have people say from, oh, this, this area is uh, interesting for me in regards to how people speak. There are a lot of individuals who think I'm very rude and I probably am. You folks have greater pauses between sentences that I'm accustomed to from living on the East Coast. So we can hear a very, a very short pause between sentences means you're still talking. Your sentence pauses are longer. We think that you're done speaking. That's why we start talking over you. And then we don't realize that's what's going on. So you view it as rude. We just view it as, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize you weren't done. So there are a lot of folks who look at West and East Coast people as being very rude because they do this. They haven't met very many of us, or, and, but they come to that conclusion. Um, so we really are oriented according to evolutionary adaptation and learning to make these generalizations. They're automatic for us. Hasty generation, generalizations are when we do it too quickly. We base our viewpoints on only one or two people. So if you go online, there's a lot of discussion about politics right now. You might see somebody from a group that you've not encountered before saying something really stupid. 
And then you come to the conclusion, oh, this entire group might say something really stupid. Why? Because that's the generalization, but it's too hasty. Maybe that's a person who doesn't represent the entire group. It might be the case that's an anomaly and not how that group thinks about things in the first place. So why is that the case? We don't have, most people don't have any real interaction with a bunch of experts. We are unusual. We talk to experts all the time. That's who we are. But others don't see that. So this lack of interaction means that we make these conclusions based on faulty evidence or a lack of evidence. Um, media isn't helpful either. Our media, social media, and other information sources, we like a good story. We like it to be interesting. Usually it has to be something that's sensationalist, sensationalized, not boring. If it comes out and somebody says, oh, the same old thing happened, that's not gonna get on the news. If it's negative, then all experts in the field are considered to be the same. If there's a negative viewpoint that you have for one person, you just assume everybody acts that way. So why? There's no counter evidence. You don't meet another person. So you just assume everybody from that area is like this or everybody because until you have that challenge. Um, and so what we're seeing is just, this is all automatic. One bad apple can spoil the barrel. A few give a bad name to the many. If you have one expert who's classified as a jackass, then other people in that field are more likely to be classified that. Then it expands out to other experts in other fields become more likely to be classified as jackasses because they're different. They must share these characteristics. The institution supporting the experts can be called into question because they're where these jackasses reside, the stables. And it undermines all experts as well as the institution. Now, this depends, of course, on the situation. The more likely to have a negative stereotype based on little to no evidence is when the unknown challenges belief, values, principles, and other features. So the more chaotic a situation is, more likely it is you're going to have this undermining of expertise. So how do we change this? How do we get away from creating these situations that are bad for us. Well, all educators must be experts, but not all experts are educators. We've got to acknowledge that. Um, experts, if you want to go out and talk and give your opinion, you should be an educator first and foremost, not just merely talking. Um, our purpose of each discipline, I assume, is to improve people's lives. And we have this power to do this. We are given the power to be an expert by fulfilling degree requirements or whatever, being hired, doing these different things. So when you become an expert who's asked to offer an expert opinion, you are now an educator. You have to educate people so they understand what you're talking about to agree that they, to a degree that they can use that in their decision making. Um, so this is just part of the requirement, professional requirements. Experts who stink at education should not be out doing anything other than offering their expert viewpoint to other experts, don't go within to the, uh, the community. When communication is necessary, though, then approach it as an educator would. Assume that those who are, you are addressing are persons deserving of the respect that you would like for you and others. No demonizing, no condensation, no patronizing. Assume that the audience is interested enough to be willing to listen to you, because most of them are. And they might and hopefully they're open to learning. This is the biggie. Assume that you can be wrong. If you go in that way, then you're, it's easier to identify, identify strengths and weaknesses of what people are asking you in your own, uh, your own position. And then uh, always assume that others can teach you. I found this through my teaching career. I had one paper, one thing I put on the board that I was publishing and I taught it to the students. And one student said, well, what about this? If you've got this situation, how do you resolve it? And I looked at what I had on the board, which was a decision process. And the kid got me. I said, OK, I got to go back and I got to think about this. And I had to add a clause to take care of that situation, which was highly unlikely, but was a legitimate concern. So. Uh, that's what all experts who want to communicate need to do. 
learn to ask and learn from asking the audience. You just ask, what is it you need from me? So that they, you understand what you need to communicate. Maybe they don't need a huge background. Um, I'm writing an article on online education and how the challenges to it. I put in information about MOOCs, the massively online classes. And I was just asked by the editor to explain what that is because <laughs> my audience probably doesn't know what those are. They often can see, by the way, sometimes things you can't, which is one of the things we're doing now. Literally in this, in this uh, um, science religion lunch seminar, you probably are seeing things I don't see in what I'm talking about. So that's why we have these discussions. Most importantly, be humble. The world does not revolve around any of us and we might be wrong. We should be caring. Don't, we shouldn't feel threatened or exasperated or any other negative reactions because that shuts audiences down. I think King and Gandhi are absolutely right when they say, if you're gonna use nonviolence, you have to do it wholeheartedly. It has to be part of what you're thinking. If you want to communicate as an expert, you gotta be perfectly open to this. Be an equal, you're an expert and your opinion is different from others who are experts. But in reality, as a person, we're equal. We're no better than anyone else. And that's an important thing to keep in mind. And then be open. Allow people to question your positions, establish a respectful, not threatening demeanor. And if you have that expectation, other people have it for you as well. Encourage timely generalizations. Uh, these are, uh, so the more positive interactions you have with other folks, the more likely it is that you can build up the value of expert opinion again, the trust that they have in us. Uh, so positive interactions, focus on the common humanity and values we have between us. Um, if this is a general experience, then uh, the more we have with the community itself of these positive interactions, the more likely they are to trust us again. And it's a slow process. It's easy to destroy, it's hard to build. Uh, so reputations take a lifetime to build. One misstep can take you out, especially in our cancel culture. So you may misspeak, you may say something and uh, people are just looking for that as leverage. It can be destroyed by others based on good or bad evidence. I see that the uh, Secretary of State for Georgia was asked, was told to step down by the two Republican senators of Georgia. When asked why, they kept saying over and over that he was did something wrong with the count in Georgia, which apparently is not the case. <laughs> that this guy has done everything he has and he said, you know, you need to stop saying this, but his reputation is being destroyed just because people have that platform. So as I say, it's hard to be the adult in the room when it's so much fun to throw bombs but real reputations are built by adults. Expertise, the trust we need is, has to be built by adults. So that's the end of it. I see I went, oh, I didn't go over. So what I'll do is take this off. I'll stop this share. And then let folks have at me. I don't know if there's any chat or anything. As I listen to this uh, presentation, Dennis, and, and thank you for it. Um, I think about its applicability to people who provide expert testimony in court. Uh, I've, I'm a psychologist and I've done a, a few cases where I've been called upon to provide expert testimony. And very often the opposing side will have an expert also. And I think the mistake that I've seen others make is they come in and you know, the first they ask you questions about your credentials. So you kind of establish yourself as an expert. And then they say, what's your, in your opinion, does this person have, you know, whatever, does this person meet the criteria for PTSD, let's say. And the expert will say, yes, this person does, no. And they might say, no, this person does not meet the, uh, ex the criteria for PTSD. So that's kind of the end of story. But then, I've been asked, does this person meet the criteria for PTSD? I will explain why, and I will, I will list the criteria. And I will even say, this criteria is, uh, we're not sure if it's met or not, but it seems to lean in that direction. 
So I'm kind of educating. You talked about educating. Yeah. When you educate the person, they can come to a better understanding of of what you're saying when you explain why you got to that position rather than just acting like I'm the expert and this is what it is, period. All right. Thank you. No, I agree with you. Absolutely. And that's the education part of expertise is not just to pronounce. You, you could be absolutely right about what you're saying, but the folks who are hearing you don't know the, the background. The reason you're there as an expert is because you are an expert and they want to know what the frick is going on and they got to know how it works. So I also like, um, as I said, when somebody says something is possible, if they're a real expert in the area, they should then talk about, but we talk about probabilities. And so here's how we figured out our probabilities. This, this is probable or not. Um, Nate Silver, for example, does a nice job with this. Um, very detailed and he assumes people are interested. They are not experts, but can do it in a way that uh, when we see the numbers between uh, um, Trump and uh, um, Biden, it was, I think it was 90% in favor of Biden and 10% in favor of Trump. And he said, but that doesn't mean Biden will win. There's a 10% chance. So if we ran this a hundred times, 10 times Trump wins. 90 per times Biden wins, but what happens is the election is determined by the votes. <laughs> you count the votes and that tells you which one of these actually is the case. So I think you're absolutely right. Loretta, do you wanna come back with what you had? I'm not quite sure if it fits here, but recently I just had an interaction that, that kind of shook me and I think it applies here. Uh, I had a student who, <laughs> I guess, disagreed with um, something that I was talking about in class referring to the consolidation or intersection between race, class, and gender. Instead of coming to me, either calling me, sending me an email, um, they went right to the equity and diversity office claiming that I had been um, discriminatory. Mm -hmm. um, luckily, I had taped all my lectures because I do them high flex and they called me right back and said absolutely not there's a but you know that that now that feeling of disquiet and i'm fearful you know i i do have the and i had the you know the the reports behind me the numbers that i'd looked at you know the evidence for what i was saying but it sure it shakes me to the core because I have no way of, <laughs> you know, I couldn't, I don't even know who the student was because of course that's confidential. So I, I don't even, I, I can't even have a discussion with that person to reestablish my credibility. Right. Well, I, I think it's interesting here in a variety of ways. One of them is, this. I think this is part of telling folks that their opinion is as good as anybody else's. That is just a matter of opinions that everybody equally should be um, taken seriously. Because if you start off with a little bit of humility and say, okay, this person is hired by the university to teach. So I should come in with at least a little bit of, this person might know what she's talking about. And so if I hear something, I wanna hear, go and say, look, I'm worried about this, Approach it that way instead of automatically going for the, okay, this had to happen because my I see it as this. The subjective view is more important. I got reported for an article that I was using um, by uh, Lawrence Thomas. And he talks about the difference between racism and sexism. And his argument is that uh, racism is easier to eliminate from society than sexism is. And whether or not you agree with that, the, he starts off with a uh, paragraph in which he uses the N-word, it's written out. And he also uses, calls, uses a word to talk about a woman, uh, a derogatory word for a woman that starts with the letter C, which I will not use. Thank you. And <laughs> so I was reported because the student 
said that because uh, Lord Thomas was using it, somehow it reflected on me that I was racist. And I said, no, this is just Thomas's words. We're looking at the author himself. And this was dropped when it turned when the student was told that Thomas is a uh, black philosopher. So then it became all right. And by the way, I'm fine with that, but the, I would have preferred the students say, hey, look, <laughs> can we have a little bit of a chat about it? And I'm more than happy to talk about it because this um, Thomas wrote the article in an era in which you could actually write it out, the word out, um, and say it. He wants people to say it because he wants that non-cognitive impact as part of his argument. You should be outraged. You have that emotional reaction. He says, see, you got that. But when you use these other words, you don't have the same reaction for women being treated like this. Anyways, that was a long response, sorry. Well, but that's what I'm getting at. I, I wish I'd had that opportunity to have that discussion because I was using, you know, statistical analyses and, and arguments that were there uh, based on race and social class and, you know, the, the inequality that we see in terms of, of um, uh, rates of incarceration are different for blacks and whites and <laughs> it's reality. They didn't like it, what I said, but that's reality. And so I'm I'm getting judged for reality. <laughs> right. so. And now I don't know if my credibility is blown or not. And yeah. I, you know. <laughs> well, I, probably with that student, I don't know how they handled it. Um, hopefully they talked to that individual and said, hey, look, this is, she's absolutely right in what she's saying. Um, because this is a learning opportunity, but I, I don't know how they did it. Um, the person who did told the student who complained about me said, oh, she, as soon as she found out about uh, Thomas's race, she was fine. Um, so hopefully that student did that too, but um, no, I don't know how to fix that because- Well, I did provide for the equity office, sorry, I interrupted you, but I did provide um, the articles and statistical analyses that I was relying on so that they could share that with the student. Okay. Yeah. That's a help. That's a help. But then you sit here on pins and needles for the rest. I mean, yeah. for a week, I, I could hardly open my mouth. Yeah. And I was talking about gender the next day. I mean, that was just <laughs> wonderful. Go from race to gender. And now I got religion coming up next week. And it's like, ah. Yeah. And see that, as I said, bad apples will affect our ability to communicate as experts because automatically people just sort of start labeling all of us as crackpots or uh, ivory tower people and so on um, i've been seeing some uh, they think that everybody at a university is liberal this sort of extreme illiberal viewpoint now there are folks at universities who are like that but this university has conservative people. Now, some of them are the radical conservatives, which are extremists, but there are a lot of conservative conservatives. There's a lot of liberal liberals. <laughs> they, they don't seem to have much problem with each other. Other questions for me? Hey, Dennis, this is Dave. Do you think that the, the problems that we're seeing today are driven more by experts who fall into these problems that you've outlined? or because experts and pseudo experts are being uh, exploited to, to uh, move forward political issues? I think they're both. I think you're, you're, you've got the ones who make huge mistakes um, and the scandals just undermine a whole bunch of work. And so when somebody's spectacularly off this, this poll stuff that's been going on, the polls were off and I've been hearing repeatedly, why do we even bother polling people anymore? Now, for political polling, I think they're right that the, the political stuff was quite a bit off, especially with uh, um, the margins for various states that are now absolutely tight beyond belief. But what that means is there's a um, snowball effect. So the real polls, the ones, or I'm sorry, the, the ones that were more accurate are now gonna get smeared too. And so a lot of them had the numbers right, but uh, they, they weren't the popular ones. And then 
my biggest concern is when we do public opinion, say on same-sex marriage, on abortion and all the rest of it, now those all can be disposed of too because they get smeared with the same, well, pollsters are really bad at what they do. Then you've got the political ones, you've got groups of folks who they've got their endpoint and then they're gonna construct the way to get there. So, if, if, and that's the other one you're talking about where you have um, pseudo intellectuals uh, who I call them talking heads who can give an opinion on everything. They're usually wrong, but we, we know that the more certain a person is in their viewpoint, the more likely they're going to be believed. Unfortunately, at the same time, they're generally wrong. The ones who have nuance are the ones who don't get listened to because they sound like they're hesitating uh, when they're thinking about these different things. So, and then you've got just the sheer politics. Uh, we have an election that seems to be going very well in the vote counting. There don't seem to be very many pieces of fraud. I mean, there's just, it looks, like we did an amazing, the US did an amazing job with this thing. And it's being called into question. Why? Because I think they, the folks who are doing it want to delegitimize the Biden presidency. That uh, not only to uh, provide solace to a particular person's ego, but also to undermine the person coming in. So I don't know. That, that I don't know what to do with. Uh, experts can only go so far. <laughs> you've got to have a you got to have a marketplace that'll actually listen to these folks. If your marketplace is so corrupt with mob mentality, there's nothing we can do um, except talk to those that slice of folks and I think maybe 50, 60 percent of the population who actually will still respect expert opinion. Now let's say 60. That makes me feel better. <laughs> your comment here. Yeah. George, go ahead. Well, your comment about uh, probability uh, brings to mind uh, how meteorologists are considered not to be very good at what they do because they always get the weather wrong. But the data shows that when a meteorologist says there's a 75% chance of rain, 25% of the time it will not rain. Yep. And it's actually very good at, at that. Yeah. But people don't understand. They think if it's 75% chance of rain, it's going to rain. It doesn't rain, so the meteorologist is wrong. Right. No, that's not the way to interpret. Well, I think that's an important point because we, the way most people think about things in life, we don't really do the probability calculation or understand how that works very well. So we put it in perspective of what is happening to me. Did it actually happen to me? Is it immediate? Um, so here, the weather forecast is for an enormous area of geographic area, just gigantic amount of space, 300, 400, 600 miles. And that's a, that's a lot. So if it doesn't rain where I am, it must not have rained. When it actually, it did rain, it did exactly hit, they were right. Um, but this immediacy, we don't understand probabilities at all. For example, a lot of people play the lottery, they don't get it. That uh, winning the lottery once is more unlikely than you being hit by lightning four times and surviving all four or taking a dime and throwing it just in the middle of a football field, having somebody blindfolded, walk out into the field and pick that up in the first go, that you're more likely to be able to get that dime than to win the lottery once. <laughs> and so these probabilities are really hard to figure out. Although we do it a lot, I, and so this is, I think there's a base there. So if I step, I see a car coming, especially in North Dakota now that the weather's changed, you give it more time or you, you're a little more cautious. Why? Because cars can't stop on ice very well. And you sort of can predict, yeah, I better, <laughs> it's more likely that I'm going to get a uh, car sliding through than just to stand here and, and do it. But I don't know how to fix that. I think it's just because of how our brains are structured. The immediate evaluation, 
through evolution was the one that uh, uh, was favored because the faster you can make a decision of fight, flight, freeze, do nothing, the more energy you can serve correctly if you do it right. So it's really hard for us to do the, the, the nuanced, but you're the, you're the expert in the area. What do you think, George? Well, you know, I, I certainly agree with you. Um, uh, we have uh, we have our, our biases that plays a role in that as well. Um, um, you know, I don't know uh, how to add to what you're saying other than, uh, yeah. Um, um, we need to educate people is what we need to do, but uh, I think that's one of the big problems in our country today is that we have, as educators, we have failed to improve the critical thinking among people and they latch on to irrational beliefs uh, about what's going on because they hear it from people and it gets back to what you were saying. Somebody who's an expert who comes or says they're an expert or they think they are an expert and says something outlandish, people, some people latch onto that. I mean, if a movie, if a movie celebrity said something, even if it, was, if it was stupid, you know, some people are gonna say, well, he said it was right, so it must be true that Martians are, you know, invading North Dakota or something. Right. Well, Jenny McCarthy, I think, should face criminal charges for her attacks on vaccination. That uh, these some of these anti-vaccine folks have caused suffering of children have caused death because of the stupidity and the uh, we've we've seen what the original study that got this thing started in the first place is crap it should never have been published it's been retracted but it's too late it's out there um but i think you're right uh we give credence to folks we shouldn't be giving credence to are there other questions I think one problem is that the media tends to decide who our experts are. Yeah. And they'll pick somebody, whether it's a, a science or economics or whatever, and they get plugged in and they're the source authority. And there can be, you know, other so called experts who have totally diverse opinions, mm -hmm. but they are totally shut out of the conversation. And it's something that's, I think, driven by the media. I think that's absolutely right. So what I've been writing on the COVID stuff and thinking about it. And so one of the issues is whether or not masks are effective in um, uh, slowing COVID's uh, the infection rates and so on. And so the the actual the studies are still being done. It's going to take us a long time to get these done because it's a hard thing to study. You have to do a lot of work. So we had people who were coming out and saying, oh, they don't do anything at all because of these things. They misquote the material and all the rest of it. Then the other ones, there was a, the head of the CDC said, if everybody wore masks, we would kill this within six weeks, which is also BS. And so you've got these, and but they're on television. And I'm thinking, get the person from Minnesota who did this, the, actually did the report and said, look, we don't know, we need to do more research, but let's do this because it's a safety precaution. We think it might work. It doesn't really require that much to do, um, but use common sense with it. And then when we're talking about mask use as well, acknowledge these are actually hard to use. You have to, I just, by the way, I just did this wrong. You're supposed to wash your hands 20 seconds before you pick up your mask. So their hands are clean because if you don't, then you contaminated it. Before you take it off, you're supposed to wash your hands. And when you, after you take it off, you are supposed to wash your hands. And then when I put it on, this is bad. I've got things opening here and through here. And then it comes up through my nose. But this is the sort of stuff that most people don't know that they're supposed they're supposed to know about. But you don't hear that. What do you hear? People complaining about wearing masks or not. 
people's uh, the stupid little stories they have where somebody goes into a store and no let's actually talk about how it works but that's boring and so i think you're right that uh you know, i'm a retired physician and i think that one thing COVID has taught us is that there is no expert in COVID. you know to have anybody say that they're an expert is a fallacy when you look at what you know came out of china what the, what uh the world health organization has said what the cdc has said uh you know they've all said things you know i guess based on what they knew at the time but they were wrong they were wrong about how it transmitted they were wrong about using a mask and you know the fact that or the the thought that they are promoting people as experts in in covid is a fallacy. There, you know, looking back a year or two from now, we'll be able to make some judgments. But people are making judgments now, and I think it's really wrong what they're doing. And I, I mean, I agree. You know, the thing that we can do is wear masks. And I mean, that's, uh, I mean, that's just critical. But other than that, you know, with the vaccine coming, hoping, hope, you know, that will make a difference. But I'm not sure there's anything we can do to stop this you know, other than just using common sense and, and you know, distancing and wearing masks. Well, I, I think you're right. And um, one of the things I'm worried about mask mandates is an unintentional consequence, which is when people think they're wearing masks, they think that everything's fine. Um, social distancing, I think, is more important. <laughs> and uh, yeah. also this stuff, which I have the you should constantly be making sure your hands are clean, you your face, your touch, and all the different things. And so we're not, we think, again, I think we're very simplistic. We find one thing and we say, this will take care of everything without realizing it's a complex, you need to do this, 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 and this in order to, again, probability, decrease your chances of spreading it decrease your chances of getting it <laughs> but there's not nothing's a magic gun on this thing yeah i wish i wish we could mandate wearing masks but i mean that's just not practical we, we still can't get people to uh, wear seatbelts. i know you're going to get them how are you going to get them to, to wear masks well that's a perfect example because what happens when you talk about seatbelt use is well did you hear this person was killed in a car accident being burned because they couldn't get out of their seatbelt well, yeah, okay. Suppose it actually did happen. Is that one out of a million? <laughs> exactly. Because the vast majority of people are saved by seatbelts or their injuries are reduced by seatbelts. <laughs> so if they didn't work, we would have used the expert data by now. <laughs> anyway, so anyone else have a question for me? I suppose I would ask, uh, how do we get away from, as Loretta mentioned, we have experts out there who are very knowledgeable, but if their credibility gets hit or tarnished, um, they're afraid of continuing on and um, speaking up on certain matters. So what do we do about individuals that are idolized, as I think it was James that mentioned, uh, people that are on the news, returning guests that are just sort of always there filling in and being the so on expert in this pretty much anything that's addressed. How do we get away from idolized people? There's certain individuals that people enjoy a certain author. Maybe they love all of her books, all of the things she's presented on every talk. How do we get away from idols essentially? Oh, that's a hard question. Because what you, I would do is normally give, well, in a rational world, this is how it would work. Unfortunately, we don't live in a rational world. So how do we persuade people? And what seems to be the case when people are really bad at what they do, at their thinking processes and so on, is they're persuaded by very aggressive behavior, very positive behavior and assertions. If you go up there and you don't show any sort of, oh, well, um, nuance or anything along those lines, where you say, this is how it's going to go. This is the case. Think Pat Buchanan. Wrong on so many different things, but hugely respected as an expert. 
Um, what's his face? Carl Rove. Same thing. Gigantically wrong, yet still has a, <laughs> a place to go. So I think that the folks who are facing this, who are real experts, need to be able to just say with pure confidence, and this is how it is, and maybe that will be the most persuasive. I know that's not great, but it might be the best we can do. Um, yeah, because if, if folks will take these people who are wrong most of the time and still believe them, then the folks who are right, what's the difference between the ones who are right? It's because they're not quite as assertive. That's yeah. another factor too, and that is appealing to feelings. When you appeal to people's feelings, you sway them in your direction. Uh, so, uh, you know, Donald Trump has used that by instilling fear in people. When they're afraid, and he says, this is, I'm going to be the one that solves that fear for you. Uh, you know, people latch on to that uh, as if he knew what he was talking about or as if he really had a plan. Uh, so emotions have a lot to do with it. You can change people's opinions uh, frequently by appealing to the feeling part, emotional part of the argument. Right. No, and that's the more powerful one because I can talk about statistics and what is it? Uh, who was it? Stalin said, uh, one death is a tragedy, a million is a statistic. And that one story, even though it completely misleads everybody, is more powerful if you've got a cute kid on it or a puppy or something like that, or you're appealing to somebody's root base that, look, my life isn't going well. I got to find someone to blame for it. So all these other folks say, it's not your fault, it's these folks. Then reason does. So we have to be better at um, rhetoric, I think. The real experts have to get a lot better at rhetoric and understand how to frame these in terms that appeal to emotion but do it in a way that's an education so that you're actually showing them the right thing and then to think for themselves in the long run. Oh, by the way, I, I'm out of time. What I wanna do is Syed just reminded me he's up two weeks from today. So <laughs> I will get that out. And so we do have a, a person who's already signed up. My senility in this time of COVID is, is quite amazing. Um, but if there's any, just a quick question I can end on. If not, I'll let y'all go. Just one, one quote from Bertrand Russell, oh. where he said, the, the, the ignorance are always cocksure, but the intelligent are full of doubt. And that's a perfect note to end this on. So I thank everyone for coming and I'll see you two weeks from today. <laughs> <laughs>